We set our hearts on fire. Wouldn't that be good? He can do that, and we're thankful for it. We're going to be on an amazing journey this morning. Anybody? Uh, you need your seatbelts for this Sunday. You need your seatbelts. We're going to be on an amazing and powerful journey about what's the meaning of Pentecost and how the meaning of Pentecost has been fulfilled. Everybody say fulfilled. fulfilled. We're seeing it in our generation. Now this morning, I want you to raise your right hand. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> This morning is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, according to God's word. This morning, the spreading flame of the gospel to all nations. And this beautiful, beautiful passage we'll read in just a minute. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus had raised from the dead. He was walking around for 40 days before he ascended. And before he ascended, he spoke these words. Now, what do these words in Acts chapter 1, verse 8 have to do with L.A., that is the L.A., not now, but the L.A. period? Uh, let's bow together. Heavenly Father, how amazing much of your fire started in L.A., the gospel fire. How thankful we are to be tied forever to the worldwide triumph of the gospel. So, Lord, guide us and be with us as we... Ex examine as we exalt your wonderful accomplishment that you promised and it happened. I pray you guide us by the Holy Spirit. May we feel the fire and blaze of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus said, and you shall receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, that's everyone. So we're, when the Holy Spirit comes within us, comes upon us and in us, we receive power, dunamis, and you should be my witnesses. That's everyone, both in Jerusalem, Judea, so it's Jerusalem, greater Judea, then Samaria, then to the ends of the earth. That's our purpose and that's our plan. So what does that have to do with L.A.? Does anybody wonder? Certainly it's not a promise right now, but it's a promise in the past. What, is, what does it have to do with L.A. directly and wonderfully? First of all, the Azusa Street Revival happened in L.A. After the, in the early 1900s. Are you aware of that? This revival went to the world. It was a Pentecostal revival that literally between the Baptist and Pentecostal, there are only 300 to 500 million people between the two movements. But the Pentecostal Azusa Street, Azusa Street Revival happened in L.A. Can you believe that? Now, what second thing happened in L.A.? that this movement went to the world and every nation. The first evangelistic crusade of Billy Graham was, guess where? L.A. LA. I'm so thankful in 2005, we went to Pasadena and got to see his last formal crusade, Billy Graham's last formal crusade in Pasadena. So Christ was risen from the dead. I'm looking up. Isn't that amazing, L.A.? Isn't that absolutely stunning? World evangelists. Remember, Billy Graham went beyond the, behind the Iron Curtain. Communist countries even let Billy Graham in. Amazing. From 1950 to 2005, he went to every nation. So Christ rose. All authority was given to him. And he said, go to all nations with the gospel. Well, all nations, not every place, but all nations have heard the gospel and are hearing the gospel. So Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You shall receive power. That's all believers to be my witnesses. How does it happen? The Holy Spirit is doing it through us. We're not doing it by ourselves, but by the Holy Spirit. Then go into all the world, from your home place to the ends of the earth place. Jesus gave a command. He didn't give a suggestion. A lot of people feel it's the great suggestion. It was the great command of Jesus. Now, Jesus rose from the dead and soon, the Roman Empire made Christianity illegal. So, of course, the Christians listened to the Roman government, and they didn't have the faith, right? Is that what happened? No. They said God is above governments. God is above human authority. So Christianity became illegal, and immediately persecution happened to the Christians everywhere. That did not stop the flame. That did not stop God. Isn't that great that governments... And evil people can't stop God. Isn't that great? They seem to, but they don't. 
What happened with this spreading flame? 33 AD, let's just go from the center to the whole world today. You're going to get a jet tour, a plane tour on the whole world to this day. 33 AD was the birth of the Jerusalem church by James, Bishop James. Remember the one that wrote the book of James, the half-brother of Jesus, right? What do you mean half-brother? Uh, James was the product of the union of Mary and Joseph. Jesus was not the product of the union of Mary and Joseph, but he was virgin born from heaven, okay? So James had the Jerusalem church for many years, up to, to 20,000 people at that time. Then the, the news spread, they obeyed Jesus, it went to Antioch. But how, but you know, I ask the question, how did this great gospel flame, what happened that caused this to happen? In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, you know, let's get real. How did this happen? To go from this little place in Jerusalem to the whole world now. Well, Christ's power in the church. Christ said, when I build my church, not any church, you can be a church, but not uh, be under the authority of Christ. But if you're under the authority of Christ, look at Matthew 16, 18. And I'll say to you, you're Peter. On this rock, meaning belief, I will build my church, Jesus said. I will build my church. The gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. They cannot come against it. They cannot overpower it. It will overpower them. So how is it happening? The power of Christ in the church has caused it. So how did the spread of the church happen? Well, in Antioch, the, look at the world map for a minute. Every major nation has the church in it. It's amazing. How did this happen? By the power of the Holy Spirit and obedience to disciples. Jesus said, you shall go to the ends of the earth. How did the, first of all, how did the gospel come to America? Anybody know how the gospel came to America? Sure. The pilgrims and the Puritans, same thing. The pilgrims brought the gospel to America, but also James Colony. There's a lot of misunderstanding of history. There's a lot of misreading of history. I've studied it in depth. In depth. In Jamestown, they came to Jamestown to colonize, but also they sent missionaries to evangelize. And actually, they were not, uh, but pure evangelists in Jamestown. So Jamestown, then the pilgrims came for the express purpose of spreading the gospel. But let's go back to James in Jerusalem. Then, all of a sudden, it expanded to Antioch. Antioch's a special place. If you look on a map, Antioch is a really special place because of Acts 11, 27, or 26. And when they found him, they brought him to Antioch, and it was a entire year that they met with the church and taught considerable numbers of people. So the church spread to Antioch, and the disciples, that's of Christ, followers of Christ, were first called Christians in Antioch. Do you realize Christians didn't give the name? The community gave the name to them. Christians means followers of Christ, ones like Christ. That's what the word meant, followers of Christ. So Antioch, then what happened to the church? The church went, I have my little diagram here, i got to go in order. Then the church, after Antioch, uh, then the church went to Ethiopia. Remember Acts chapter 8? Philip evangelizes the Ethiopian, he goes back to Ethiopia, he starts a church, becomes a bishop, starts a church there. Ethiopia was, has had Christianity for 2,000 years. Does everybody hear me? For 2,000 years, Ethiopia has had the gospel. Then Paul had three missionary tours. Then Thomas went to India and planted a colony and a church there that stands even today. Thomas' church stands today. He went evangelizing India. Then, amazingly, the church in 54 AD, do you realize there was a church in Rome founded in 54 AD? Paul would write the letter to that Roman church that was founded uh, to, the, to the colonies. Now, in Rome, from 33 AD to 325 AD, Christianity was illegal. Up until Constantine, <laughs> Constantine was converted and became a Christian, and all of a sudden said, no more illegal Christianity. But at that time, it was like, a, that was a moot point. That was almost a ridiculous point. One in two people in Rome at that time, in 325 AD, were Christians. So the spreading flame of Rome did not kill the Christianity. 400 AD, 
amazingly. 400 AD, a man from England, Patrick, went and spread the gospel to Ireland, and the whole place became believers in Christ, the whole place in Ireland. Now, at this time, the most amazing thing happened. From 500 AD to 700 AD, an island in England that has been marked by archaeology and history, an island in England became what they called the gospel send sending to the world place. So English Christians had a beautiful fortress that they trained people to take the gospel to the world. So the gospel went to the whole world in amazingly, amazing time. Now, in 580 AD, there was the birth of Islam. The birth of Islam tried to put out the plague. In seminary, I had special studies because I had special interests, and I did special study time because I had a wonderful library up at University of Dubuque Seminary, and it was great to do some extra study on some extra things. But in 580 AD, the birth of Islam, and immediately Muhammad went to Jerusalem, the Middle East, and North Africa. North Africa started exploding with believers. In fact, Augustine, the great theologian of North Africa in 425 AD, was in Hippo. Hippo was a place in North Africa, and it was just exploding with Christians. Well, at that time, Islam came in and destroyed much of North Africa, much of the Middle Eastern churches, and Jerusalem took care, took away all the churches in Jerusalem. So it challenged the flame. And I read the first-hand accounts of all how sad it was, how, how the early church struggled with, Lord, why did you allow this? Lord, why was this allowed? this reign of terror, literally. <clears throat> That's large swaths of area. As you know, uh, North Africa, Middle East, and Jerusalem. Also, Turkey took away the churches in Turkey. But, guess what? The gospel still spread wonderfully and beautifully. You know, I, I think it spread wonderfully and beautifully because of the fact that the early believers really listened to Jesus and obeyed him. Now, the good news is, it didn't end with bad news. This next picture is a picture of the Battle of Tours, which I studied in depth. The Battle of Tours, just you need to put on your calendar. In 732 AD, Islam had swathed through the Middle East, North Africa, and now it targeted Christian Europe. And they said that they were going to destroy Christian Europe. And they amassed a huge army. And they ended up going through the portal of France. In the Battle of Tours, nothing short of a miracle of God, there were ten Mohammedans, one European, which primarily 80% were Christian at that time, one European versus one, ten Mohammedans, uh, they came up and there was no chance that they could stop them. Charles Martel, in the Battle of Tours in 732 AD, stopped the advance of Islam. The, the Europeans lost 1,500 people. The Mohammedans lost 300,000. And they lost so many people that they turned back from coming up and destroying Christian Europe. I'm so thankful that that was my, one of my special studies, too, because that battle was so critical outside the Reformation. What trying to destroy the flame at that time would have been dramatic. But what did they do? What did, our, what did the people of Christianity from the very beginning do? Well, they took seriously Mark 16, 15. And he, Jesus, said to them, that is all his followers, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. That's the command of Christ. There are no exceptions. There are no, uh, you know, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he said, go into all the world. Look at Mark chapter 16. I love this verse. It says this, Mark 16, 19 through 20. The Lord Jesus had spoken to them, and then he was received up to heaven. He was raised and received up to heaven. And sat at the right hand of God, and they, that is the followers of Christ, went out and preached everywhere. They went and told everybody. While the Lord worked with them. So it was the Lord working in them and with them, confirming the word of God by the signs that followed. And then Jesus gave the great commission. 
how often the Great Commission is not obeyed. It was obeyed in the history of the church, but is it obeyed now? Matthew 28, 18 through 20, this commission has never been taken away. This is the mission and purpose of the church. And Jesus came to them before he ascended and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, it's a command, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So we are to go. Did the church do that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Is the church doing it now? Absolutely not. How sad. So, as the church marched on, it started to spread to all nations. Even though the, the church got captured a little bit, from 1100 to 1400, it started to get captured like the Pharisees captured the church in Jesus' day. The church in that period started to get captured by ritual and traditions of men and also a work your way to heaven scheme. But the Reformation broke through that, that stronghold of the devil and broke through it so beautifully and wonderfully. You know, it's amazing. Another great story of world evangelism and how God works. Do you realize northern Iraq, the Kurds, Christianity there has been long-standing since the days of Jonah. They've had, they've had believers in Iraq for a long time. Do you realize the gospel went to places like Japan in the 1500s, the Jesuit missionaries went there to spread the gospel? The gospel went to Canada uh, in 1500s to the Huron Indians. And literally, they built many churches in Canada until the Iroquois came down and destroyed and killed all the Huron for adopting a foreign religion. But several attempts have been to China. China's a story, but I, I race on just a little bit. China was an amazing story. With the Silk Road of Marco Polo, the gospel got into the Asia and China. But the most amazing part of China was from literally the 1800s, Hudson Taylor, to about 1949, there were more than 50,000 evangelist missionaries in China during that period of time. In fact, China exploded, 20 years ago, China exploded in Christians, in which our son was a missionary evangelist to China. And in 2010 and 2005 and 2010, there started to be the persecution, extreme persecution of the church in China. But the most famous missionary to China was amazing. Anybody watch the movie Chariots of Fire in the 80s? Anybody? Anybody old enough to watch it? Eric Little, one of the greatest Christians ever. True story. I read his 50 books about Eric Little. I was passionate about reading the true story about Eric Little. He was a fine Christian. He was a Scotsman, which makes him even better. <laughs> but anyway, he was olympically talented, <laughs> greatly, and the whole story was he would not run on Sunday, he would not dishonor God. He said, no, I'm not running on Sunday. So they, they took him out of the race in the Olympics, the Paris Olympics, and he said, great, I don't care, I honor God over man. So they found a way for him to run in a race that, that he couldn't have won because he wasn't trained for, and he ended up winning the race. But he was born in China with missionary parents, and after the, after the Olympics, they told him to go back and be famous in Scotland. And he chose to go back to China and evangelize. And he started evangelizing and he got arrested. Spent time in an internment camp in 1945. Died in an internment camp in China. You know, it's amazing what God has done in the church. In the early 1900s, the Presbyterian Church went into Korea and amazingly, amazingly evangelized Korea, which we see the products now. Other churches came in also after the Presbyterian Church. The most amazing thing about Africa is North Africa was a block for many, many years because of Islam. North Africa, they couldn't get down to Central and South Africa, but God broke through. Another amazing story from the 700s. I've read this story in Mission. From 700 AD, do you realize the gospel penetrated Russia? And Russia has had a long history of the church and the gospel in Russia. In fact, it was, we have the Greek Orthodox Church and the Russian Orthodox Church birthed through that. 
So the flame tried to stop. <laughs> I mean, Satan tried to stop the flame of the gospel. Through Roman Empire, it didn't work. Through the Islamic Empire, which didn't work. Through the internal working, that, well, that's when almost Satan killed the church, is when he got inside the church, in the councils of the people there. But Jesus said this, and it's never been taken away. Jesus said, Matthew 24, 14, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come, meaning he will come again. So Jesus prophesied, it will happen. So what we celebrate today, this Pentecost, is, is it has happened. Not everyone reached, but every nation, everybody has the potential to be reached with the gospel. And it is dramatic. And I am so thankful that Christ prophesied it, and it has happened. Amen. It's happened. <laughs> It's absolutely amazing. I know it's it's not your fault. I you know, but because I can't see your smiles again. <laughs> but it has. But you know what? I can actually do the math. Some of you anyway. <laughs> it has happened. I just had to stop because it's so wonderful. Now, what has stopped the church? What what great obstacles have come up? Well, in 1864, the great great obstacle to the church has come up since 1864. The gospel has tried to be stopped in the world since then. That was when replacing God had happened in that time. But really one of the greatest enemies now and in the 1940s to the church was communism. More people have died, more Christians have died by communism both in Africa and in the world, in China, because of communism. So it's the great one trying to kill the flame. But you know what? Christ can't be stopped, regardless of communism, regardless of all the evil things that man puts up. Because look at Revelation. If this isn't as stunning to you, it's stunning to me. The Lord said, I'm going to take the gospel to all nations, and all people living everywhere will be in heaven. There will be people that are from every nation that's accepted the gospel. Revelation chapter 7, 9 through 10. And Paul looked up, or John looked up, the apostle John looked up to heaven, and behold, a great multitude with no one could count. Boy, no one could count. That's amazing. From every nation, every tribe, every people, every language, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. The nations have been reached. In heaven, there's going to be people from every nation sitting there. The great age of the Protestant Reformation was the gospel re-initiated re in the church from being lost through tradition, through ritual, through locking the Bible up in the Latin. Many people call the Reformation the second Pentecost, which truly is. But this gospel went to all nations. Hawaii, the gospels in the 1700s. Caring went to India, carrying the gospel, uh, to China. But the most amazing work of all was the work of David Livingston. Has anybody ever heard of David Livingston? I hope you have. Stanley went and looked for him. Who is this guy that's been in Africa all this time? He was a trained missionary. He was a Scottish man again. Boy, oh, sorry, so many Scots. He was a Scottish man who joined the London Missionary Society. He loved Charles Finney, the revivalist here in America. And he was trained as a doctor. And he said he wants to go to Africa, Central Africa. At that time, no one had gone to Central and South Africa and preached the gospel. Everybody claims he's an explorer, he's a this, he's a that. He came preaching the gospel. He walked more miles preaching the gospel than any man living, including the Apostle Paul. David Livingston went through Central Africa and South Africa preaching the gospel, and eventually he was so beloved, so beloved by the Africans that they wouldn't let the, his body be taken back when he died to England. They would not allow it. They said, we want him to stay here. And he put in his will that he would be buried in Africa, where his heart was, David Livingston. A man who did so much for just one man, one evangelist, doing so much, 
Do you know he, what he wrote? He was also extremely good at doctoring. He was attacked by lions several times. One time it should have killed him and he didn't die. He, he wasn't even hurt. But a lion attacked him and God preserved his life. But do you realize what other things he did? He described the slave trade the first hand in the early 1800s. His good friend was William Wilberforce, who abolished slavery in England in the late 1700s. His good friend. And he described what's happening in Africa for the first time that went to the world. And what was amazing about it is he found it wasn't just the Portuguese that were slavers. They were the evil slavers. But it was the Arabs. And the Arabs would, were taking thousands upon thousands and taking them north. And he described that. He was the first to describe it as a rabid anti-abolitionist in the early 1800s. He went preaching the gospel. He went uh, converting thousands upon thousands of people. They estimated that over one million people converted by David Livingston. You know, it's amazing, the, the works of God. This is just hard to cut short because the works of God are so amazing. Do you realize Thomas Jefferson in 1790 as president, used government money to translate the Bible into Native American language. That was his Native American language uh, process that he accomplished. Do you realize the great expanse of the church has been absolutely stunning and amazing? It's been beyond belief. Um, I'm so thankful the gospel's gone to India, to Canada, to Africa, to China. Uh, there's a picture of Sundar Singh. I'd like to show the picture of Sundar Singh. His picture is, he's from India. And um, he was a man in the early 1900s. He persecuted the church like Paul. And he wanted to get rid of the church in India. And Christ appeared to Sundar Singh. He was converted and became a mighty Indian evangelist. You'll see him in all the records of mission studies. And he went through Bengal tiger places, <laughs> as David Livingston went through active places where they had African lions, he went through Bengal tiger and was never touched. And the, the people were, many of them were converted because of the miracles. They said any man that travels through these jungles is never killed by a lion, I mean a, a tiger in India, we will listen to Sundar Singh, another great evangelist, gone to the world. Do you realize that the world has gone to the... I wish we had time to talk about the Amazon with Aviation Fellowship in the 1500s, the Elliots, that went to the place in the Amazon and planted a church as which the gospel went to Brazil and the Amazon also in the 1800s and 1900s. It's amazing what happened in the Amazon with the Aviation Fellowship. It's been put in a film, uh, End of the Spear, how this tribe was killing each other off, and they loved to spear, spear anyone, and they went in to evangelize that tribe, and they, all the people said, you're crazy, you're gonna be killed. And he said, well, if we're killed, then God will make sure and produce a seed of the gospel. They were killed because they had guns, and they, they came at them with spears, and they said, we're just going to become a martyr. So they agreed, the Elliots, and they were killed. Ten years later, the gospel missionaries went back, their wives, converted all the tribes there. They became Christian. And the one who killed one of, one of, the, one of the sons of the Elliot went back to that area. And the man who had killed his father, who became a Christian in the Amazon, became the best friends with the son. Now that's not made up, that's, that's only God. These people that put their lives at risk for the gospel. I can tell you of stories that are unbelievable. How there was a revival in Iran in 2007. How, how did God witness to the Middle East? Do you realize he used Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ? A rumor went out, so everybody in the Middle East Every Muslim watched it. Because of that, they watched the film of the gospel. Many were converted. Now we have the gospel going through satellite. And I wonder if Revelation, if you have a Bible, or you write this down, write this down, you go research it yourself and prove me right or wrong. 
But in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 of the future, it said, Up in mid heaven, I saw a messenger having the eternal gospel to preach to all the people of the earth. Revelation 14, 6. I saw up in mid heaven a messenger. The word is angel, but the word is messenger, Greek. Having the eternal gospel to preach all people of the earth. Mid heaven is up where planes fly. I saw something up in mid heaven Anybody thinking right now? Revelation 14, 6, in the last days. What's up in mid-heaven proclaiming the gospel? Satellites. Dish network. Internet. Direct TV. YouTube. A satellite is producing <laughs> YouTube, this message today. On YouTube and it's up in a satellite the gospel is being proclaimed by satellite is that the fulfillment I don't know but does it fit I think so who reached the world though not just great evangelists but every single person that came to Christ went out and obeyed Jesus and shared the gospel do you realize Korea was won by evangelists and then women created Bible studies every part of Korea in the early 1900s. Women went out and did Bible studies and converted people in their apartments in Korea. But one of the greatest revivals, and I like the picture of this man, Billy Graham. One of the greatest revivals to the whole earth was Billy Graham. He was invited to all nations, even behind the Iron Curtain, like I said. And from two, 1950 to 2005, he went to all the nations with the gospel, Billy Graham. I remember at 11 years old listening to Billy Graham. My parents didn't go to church. He was the only gospel I heard at 11. And what was amazing about that at 11 years old is he was on about every, what, four months at that time. And he was on TV all the time. And when he'd go to nations, they had broadcast it on that TV. And let me tell you something that I just praise God for. It, it wells such emotion. Do you realize the USA has sent out more gospel evangelists than all the other nations combined? The United States for 400 years, which the gospel has burned brightly. Now, how is God reaching the world? He is. The most amazing thing is the, there's a great recession in America and Europe of the gospel, but God's moving on with other nations that receive him. Do you realize God is reaching the Middle East right now in an amazing way through Iran? God is reaching Jerusalem. Did you know 25 years there was only two Messianic Jewish synagogues in Jerusalem? Did you know today, as of this day, there are 22 Messianic, believing in Jesus, 